Speaker, Margo Williams, Queens, Poughkeepsie, an actress and dancer who became a famous journalist. Now, how did that happen? That is a story you will have to ask her because it's a very exciting. In any event, uh, she is a member of a couple of teams that won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting around terrorism in 2002 for the Washington Post, and another one a couple of years later for some skullduggery in the police department of Washington, D.C. She then went on to the New York Times where she joined another team of investigative reporters and looking into a wide variety of uh, uh, terrorism activities. She's going to talk today about one uh, a part of her journalism uh, legend that has to do with the CIA's teams that delivered Al-Qaeda and ISIS and whatever they're called in those days to secret prisons. Uh, it's a delight to have Marco here today, and I wish you would join me in giving her a nice, warm welcome. Thank you, Marco. Well, thank you for having me here at Dartmouth. And I don't think I've ever been to New Hampshire before this morning. Uh, so I saw some snow and some mountains. And now I have to go back to DC tomorrow. So I guess I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing a bear, because I hear there's one very close by. Um, uh, I'm a journalist, and I consider myself a journalist, but actually my role in, in all the newsrooms where I've worked has been as a research editor. A, first a researcher and then a research editor, and my background is as a librarian. Um, I, I, I'm going to tell the story. I guess I'll tell the story. Because I, why did I want to be a journalist? Because I saw a movie with Katherine Hepburn and, and Spencer Tracy when I was a little kid. And the movie was called Desk Set. And it was about a research librarian at a big broadcast organization that looks suspiciously like NBC News. And um, it was in Rockefeller Center anyway. And she had a whole staff of very well-dressed 1950s style colleagues. And one day they brought in this gigantic computer from IBM that took up the whole room. And with the computer was Spencer Tracy the programmer. And all of the researchers were very afraid that the computer was going to take their jobs over. And um, they had a kind of contest over who could answer the questions better and faster, the computer or Katherine Hepburn. And quite frequently, or probably all the time, she did win. But um, in the end, she fell in love with the, with the programmer. And they decided that the computer and the, and the librarian could work very well together. This is 1954, so I always, and I'm not the only one. The character's name was Bunny, and one of my best friends, who's the same role that I'm in at, uh, at the, I was in at the Washington Post, is her job at the New York Times. Her name is Katie Bennett, and we call each other Bunny. As a matter of fact, all of us who do this call each other Bunny. It's kind of a code word for, for the Katherine Hepburn character. Well, anyway, so coming from the research world, and. Um, just like in the movie, pr probably in the late 80s, early 90s, we started using computers in the libraries. Um, and in fact, in the newsrooms at the Washington Post, where I started in 1990, the researchers in the library were the only people who had computers. Everyone else was working on these gigantic things that were editorial systems. The one at the Washington Post was called Ray Edit. It was from Raytheon. And, and everyone just typed into it. It didn't. It, it was stupid. It was just the thing that typed and it type said it. Um, so anytime anyone needed a computer, they had to come back and talk to a librarian to 
to you. So they weren't allowed to go online. They weren't allowed to go into Nexus or anything. Only we had to do it. So we were the gatekeepers. So almost 30 years later, um, most of us have lost our jobs. Um, uh, and we're all retiring now, and there aren't very many new people coming in to do these jobs, because over the years, no matter how hard we tried, it turned out that they didn't need researchers, they thought, because they have Google, you know, and, uh, and they, everyone could do it for themselves. But I managed to carve a niche out for myself in something called computer assisted reporting, which is even 10 years after that it was called computer assisted reporting, now it's called data journalism. So uh, this uh, tracking the planes to the black sites was like early data journalism because I used Excel to keep track of what I was doing. And um, I'm just thinking, you know, today is April 19th, and there's like certain days that you think of that changed your world, and April 19th was Waco in 1993, and in 1995, it was Oklahoma City bombing. Um, and I, I've worked on those stories somewhat, but of course, 9-11 was the date that what made the biggest difference for me, because it changed the way we, it kind of changed our world in journalism, and changed our world in international affairs, and changed our world in crime detection, all kinds of things. But for me, um, on a step back, what was going on in the summer of 2001? At the Washington Post, what was going on is we were trying to figure out if Gary Condit had killed Chandra Levy. And we, we were, that's all we were doing. It was like 24-7. I had, a, I had a database, it was in Lotus Notes, of every intern and which congressman they worked for and who knew Chandra Levy. It was like a so early social network analysis. So that's what we were doing. So, um, you know, they didn't find her body at, at, in the park which is actually, her body was found like two blocks from where I live on Brandywine, Brandywine in, in, in uh, Rock Creek Park. But they didn't find her body for several months. And so uh, the, when they did find her body, I, the editors said to me, oh, didn't you have some big database of all the Chandra Levy stuff? And like, could you go back and see what you might have in it so we could do the story? I go back to it and I look at it. The last time I made a data entry was September 10th, 2001. And, you know, never looked at it again. No one was ever talked about Chandra Levy again until the, you know, when they found when they found her body. So like there were days that that really made a difference. And and uh, I'm just gonna. It's, I'm going to kind of hop around a little bit because, like, what are the what are the black sites? So, oh, this is what I'm doing now. I forgot to tell you. I'm at the Intercept, and the Intercept is an online news site that's uh, funded by Piero Midiar, a philanthropist and founder of eBay. And we're a nonprofit news organization, and we were founded by three journalists: Glenn Greenwald, Jeremy Scahill, and Laura Poitras. Um, Laura was the person that Edward Snowden gave the NSA uh, Snowden files to. So um, they decided to found their own news organization. And one of the assets of it is that we have the Snowden documents. And I work with the Snowden documents. So that's, uh, we publish them. We go through them. We, we redact them. We figure out what's newsworthy. And then we publish them. And we are in contact with the NSA along in this process. Um, but the other thing, I'm still keeping track of terrorists. And this is a database that uh, we published with uh, another reporter, Trevor Aronson. It's a, a data set of every uh, person who had been charged with terrorism in the United States since September 11th, 2001. And we keep track of them and what's happened to them. So if you wanted to go into it and see how many have, were sentenced and what sentences they got and what state were they in and what, what were they charged with. And then how, um, so there's 850 uh, 
the people who had been charged with terrorism and how many were acquitted? Three. So um, you, it's a kind of fun thing that you might want to play with. So that's, I keep that up to date, and, and I work on the Snowden documents. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. And I'm by far the oldest person in this whole company that I'm working in. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so this is a map that one of the great young kids uh, that I work with did. Uh, he's a, he's a uh, computer artist, as a matter of fact. But the, when the um, torture report came out, so I had, had to bring books with me because you know, this is, I'm a librarian. So when the torture report came out, for the first time, we found out so 2014, December 2014, we actually, they finally said that there were black sites and what the, the names of them were. But it was still code names. The code names are maroon, brown, purple, violet, uh, uh, co cobalt. Um, and and uh, those are the code names, and we had to still figure out what countries they were in, because all those years later, they still don't say what countries they're in. And if you look, if you look in here, every page has got redactions in it. And this, this of course, is just the, what is it, 499-page uh, summary report. The other 6,000 pages are classified, and who knows when we're ever going to get to see them. But uh, so they, they gave them code names, and we figured out, and most news uh, journalists figured out where they were. Um, well, we, this is the end of where they were, because in the beginning, when we started trying to find them, we had no idea where they were. And I'm going to go through the process of how we figured out where they were. And then we kind of like, 12 years later, it's published that, that there actually were black sites in in some secret country. So what was it about? The, when they took people to these black sites, they performed enhanced interrogation techniques on them in order to try to uh, get information on what, uh, what they knew about planned future attacks. And these were the techniques that they were using at, the, at these black sites. And it's pretty obvious that uh, many people, organizations, even lawyers, would consider these illegal, illegal uh, techniques. And the techniques were derived from uh, some military training that takes place for special forces where they are taught to withstand being tortured by the enemy. So uh, these were the techniques that they thought the enemy would do to Americans. And so they uh, somehow it evolved into using these techniques that we learned to protect ourselves against the North Koreans or whoever the enemy was. Uh, that uh, we use these techniques on suspected Al Qaeda uh, uh, detainees and dietary manipulation. I mean, these are kind of the, even the nice words for them. And this was a memo. It was uh, a memo to John Rizzo, the the, uh, the, the attorney for the CIA. And it, uh, I can't remember which of the Bush uh, uh, lawyers wrote wrote this memo. But they were asking to, they were saying they had done these uh, techniques on people that were being held somewhere. So why this is, why this is relevant today, and I haven't talked about this stuff since 2007, when I looked to see, like, when was the last time I talked about it? It was 2007. And, um, so she is going uh, heading for a confirmation hearing any time. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't given us a date. But this is the topic that's going to come up when she's questioned. Because according to Mr. Rizzo, the guy who got that memo in the last, in the, uh, he said in his bio, which was approved by the CIA, that th she was in charge of the interrogation program. And um, this is. Uh, she would be the first woman CIA director. I mean, it's a pretty awesome thing. 
And uh, she, I'm sure she has had a great 30-year career in the CIA, but one of her roles, according to a CIA attorney, was that she was in, in charge of this techniques and this, and this program. So coming up soon. OK, so here's another woman from the CIA that we know um, from Homeland. And you see over next to her, there's like a blurry person sitting there. That's me. Uh, 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 one of my bucket list jobs, I said, when I retire, I'm going to do all the things I ever wanted to do. And yes, I'm an extra on Homeland. And it's been like really, it's, it's been, and I'm going to give a little clue. Uh, there's a, uh, I'm, they called me to be a reporter with a laptop. That was the role, reporter with laptop. And when I arrived, there were like 200 of us. We were in a co Senate committee hearing. So there's only two more episodes in this season, and I guess in one of those there's going to be a big Senate committee hearing. And you could, if you maybe you could look to see me. I'm I'm sitting with. They, Homeland is so awesome. They had 200 extras that day, and they took such care. They came over to my laptop and they gave me a thumb drive because they wanted a certain thing to be on the screen. It was a transcript of the thing they they were talking about. It's like, well, no one is going to see my screen. No one's even going to see me. I mean, here was my big role. I was over there in that corner. Um, but I could say, look, here, there I am with Claire Danes, you know. Uh, so, OK. October 26, 2001. There's, this is an article from the newspaper called The News in Karachi, Pakistan. And a reporter in Karachi named Masood Anwar uh, got a tip that someone at the airport in Karachi was taken in the middle of the night with a hood over his head and was put onto a, pro a, a corporate jet and taken away. And um, so Masood wrote this story. It said, and a mass US trooper was also making a video film of the entire operation. Uh, aside, when, when Gina Haspel is, has her uh, hearing she's going to be asked a lot about the videos because she's the person who approved the destruction of the videos that were taken of, of torture. Um, so uh, he did his you know, pretty good report. It happened at 2.40 AM. But here's the clue. This is the clue. He, he did the thing that made, you know, that made the story happen. The aircraft having the registration numbers N379P. So. He knew, and I, I learned, you know, that that meant it was a U.S. plane. U.S. plane's tail number says N, sitting in the airport in Karachi, taking some guy in, in uh, hooded onto the plane and flying away. And at the end of the story, um, Masood says, who is this guy? Nobody knows. It's suspected that he might be someone named Jamil Qasim Saeed Mohammed who was a biology student from Yemen, who was had st studying in Karachi. And one day, three months before, he had disappeared. And there was suspicion that he had, he had been called in for questioning about con um, uh, contacts with terrorism. Or maybe it was just a month before. Well, anyway, no one ever heard what happened to that guy again. He's, he's I mean, I, I had that on the top of my list for a long time. Like, I want to find out whatever happened to Jamil Qasim Saeed Mohammed. No one knows. He didn't turn up on, the, on this list, in the torture list. And he didn't turn up in the list of people going to Guantanamo. He's, he's in the wind, or somewhere. We don't know. So um, a reporter from the Washington Post was in Karachi, because after 9-11, they started sending people everywhere. And Rajiv, Rajiv Chantrasekharan, he was a young man who had been in the Loudoun, Virginia Bureau covering cops. And, uh, and he, after 9-11, they sent him to Karachi. Um, so he heard this story. He met Masood. And he called me up and said, what can you tell me about what, what does it mean that a tail number is N379P? Can, can, can you find out something about it? So as a matter of fact, I did. I looked it up, and I found out who owned it. And then like nothing much happened. There's Masood. He doesn't get much credit for having started this whole thing. 
His paper didn't let him write any more stories after that. He, that was it for him. Um, there's N379P. And there's Rajiv, much older now. And Peter Finn, who was also in the Loudoun Bureau with him at the time, and he was sent to cover, uh, he, he was sent to Germany and, and to Indonesia. And then that's Dana Priest, who is the reporter, uh, the uh, intelligence, uh, national security reporter, who actually wrote all of these stories that, that uh, broke, broke the stories about the secret prisons and the, and the flights. And Julie Tate, Julie is the, re the researcher who has been working on all these stories at the Washington Post. Um, so a couple of months later, March 2002, Rajiv calls me again. He's in Indonesia, and they've seen the same plane, N379P. And I look it up again, and we, you know, we have a little discussion. And, they, and Peter and, and Rajiv write a story about it. Um, in this case, it was a guy, Mohammed Sadiq Balmadni. Uh, he's still, he, he emerged. I think he was, ended up in Guantanamo, and he, uh, he has been released since then. And, um, And this is what happens when you look up, well, you look up the plane in the FAA database, and you could just put in a tail number, and then you find out who owns it. And the next step was to go to uh, the state corporate records in Massachusetts, where the plane, uh, the company was, to find out who owns, who are the people behind the plane. So the corporate records give you a list, and this is 1997, and I, you could get an annual report, you get them for every year, and then there's a list of names of people who were um, co corporate owners. So, um, and all of the addresses were to, the, uh, to an office in Denham, Mass. And Dana went there and knocked on the door. It was just like, it, there was nobody there. It was just like an office with a sign on them. Sometimes when we've gone to these things, it's a, it's a post office box in a, in, in a boxes or us or whatever, whatever. So these people actually had names. The, uh, the contact person was a person, Dean, what, uh, Placaius, and he was the attorney who set up the company. And all these other people's names, we couldn't find them. Um, the other thing that, um, that we did was try to find out where that plane had been that wasn't just sitting at those two airports. And there's various ways, of, it's better now in some ways and worse than others, of finding out where a plane has been. There's uh, of course, the FAA has a database of every flight um, where they take off and where they land, but I didn't have access to that database. The, the uh, uh, companies are able to buy that database from the FAA, and then they sell access to it. So there were a couple of companies, and um, one of them was called FBO, and another was called FlightWise, and another was called FlightAware. And the reason these companies are set up is if, we, if you have, who has a plane? Do you have anyone here? Have a plane, fly a plane, um, so that people who own planes can se can schedule the going in and out of airports, and you know have records of their flights, and you know it's a it's a professional uh, thing to have that. But but regular people could buy access to it too. So we could put in that plane, and uh, it only covered the U.S. and the U.S one stop out, to, so it leaves the US, it goes to London, we could get that far. Then on the, when you get to London, Eurocontrol takes over, not the FAA, and so Eurocontrol has the records of all the flights in Europe, and they don't, it's not, they're not public, and they don't sell them. So we could only go as far as that first flight. So we could see this plane going various places, various times in um, 2002, and it was going to some interesting places. And one other thing that I, would, I checked after, um, in mid-2002, I started checking to see well, when, which of these planes have gone to Guantanamo. Guantanamo is a, is, a, is a base that only military can use. So this plane did go to Guantanamo. And uh, it, it meant it had the uh, uh, right, uh, the uh, permissions to land at airports that were military bases. So, oh, and then there's something called plane spotters. They're kind of like bird watchers, only for planes. You know, they, they go out to airport. They used to go out to airports 
and take pictures of planes landing and taking off. And then the next step was there was computers, so they would, they would go to their computer and make a list of every plane they saw at the airport that day and then post it to a group of friends. So I kind of got into that. I said, oh, well, look, I could find this. I could find people who seen the plane. So, um, so I found a lot of the planes uh, uh, through this because seemingly these people who look at plane, plane spotters, they are all men and they are also in Germany, in Netherlands, in Sweden, there's like certain countries where Austria, so it seems to be a, a hobby of men in Europe. <laughs> well, it's also there's other hobbies. So after 9-11, some things that happened, like they, the people used to go to the airports and I would get their messages and they would have messages about, you know, where's the best place to stand in, uh, Istanbul airport to watch the planes and they would go on vacations where they would like know what room was the best room to watch the planes from so but after 9-11 they started to the authorities started to find these people very suspicious like a bunch of, of Greek guys were like plane watching someplace and they all got arrested because they thought they were terrorists because they were watching they were watching planes take off and land so I befriended some of these people and they gave me their list when they when they found that um, N379P was, had, had been seen someplace. But now, and you can see it on flightradar24.com, um, just like when you're on the plane and you get that map and it tells you that you're still like 12 hours from landing in London, um, uh, these, the planes transmit their location just <coughs> through, um, a, However, it's received by people who put up these antennas that when the planes fly over, they can get the, uh, they can receive the broadcasts from the cockpit. And um, so people all over the world are setting up these um, uh, antennae and Flight Radar 24 uh, asks people to contribute them. And if you're in a place where, where they don't have any um, of this data, they will let, they will give you a antenna so if you will promise that you will send the the data to them so a friend of mine who's a reporter in Nairobi she has just signed up to get one of these antennas she she has to keep it on her roof 24 hours a day with her computer on but then they'll give her access to all the other flight data it's it's kind of fun anyway so now you can track planes that way um, and then, as I said, the data from the FAA for U.S. flights, uh, you can buy subscriptions to, to use that. And then um, when other newspapers wrote about the data. Um, but if you own a plane, the FAA allows you to block your tail number from the public view. So for the longest time the CIA forgot to block their tail number and they and 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 we were everybody was following it I don't see how they didn't know it and and then they finally figured it oh my god like this like, reporters are following us and then anyone in the world can be following us um, yeah so when you look up premier avia executive aviation of Denim Mass they also own another plane and this was N313P so I'm tracking N 379P and then 313P um, to the, the black sites. This is Abu Zubaydah. When he was captured in March 2002, they thought he was Al-Qaeda number three. He was the worst guy ever, and he was captured in, in, in Pakistan. And they really messed him up. Um, uh, this is him recently, and he's still in Guantanamo, and he, uh, every, uh, every one of the prisoners there now gets a hearing every year to find out if they're suitable for release. And um, it's broadcast to the Pentagon, uh, and they allow reporters to come and see it, and they we can't hear it. They don't have his, him speaking. But I did finally see him. I mean, no one had seen him since March, I think, 28th, 2002. He disappeared into the black sites. And he is the detainee who is known for having experienced all of those enhanced interrogation techniques. That is the, 
that memo was about him. And uh, 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 since then, a lot of information has come out about him. And you know, there are people, uh, he has attorneys, and, but he's, uh, he lost his eye somewhere along the way also. And, um, but here he is now. In fact, I think when I saw him, he'd even shaved, shaved the beard off um, when he w was there for his hearing, to, so he could, he, he's not getting out. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with him, but uh, he, he was number three. It turns out he wasn't even in Al Qaeda. He was just, he was a facilitator. His, his, he had like a hotel in his house where, where people came through and he knew everybody, but I, um, he, he was not a trusted member of the organization. Um, but this guy, this is the bad guy, that's KSM. This is how he looked, if you remember this John Belushi look that he had the night that he was captured. And here he is in Guantanamo. Um, he, I go down there to see the trials, well, the trials, because it's, uh, there's one starting next week. It's still pretrial hearings since 2011. It's been in pretrial hearings, and um, it's the five defendants, and the five defendants, he is as the leader of the cell that flew the planes into the World Trade Center. That's him. And four other guys are with him. They all have incredible legal um, legal teams. Uh, uh, but the trial goes on and on and on. What, a couple of things that's happened in the trial, and you look, it's like so interesting. There's one reporter named Carol Rosenberg. She is at the Miami Herald. She's been there for every day of every hearing at, at Guantanamo. She, she lives in a tent there, because when you go down as a reporter, you're in a tent. So she's, she's just amazing. She's, without her, none of this would be covered. No one would know what was going on there except for um, Carol. And um, well, how did I get distracted by Carol? Anyway, she, uh, she, some of the things, if you read her reporting, and she, she has some great uh, guides to all of these different trials and who's who and what's been going on. But one thing that happened uh, one day when I was watching it, and oh, in the US, you can go and watch it from Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, there's, a, there's a room where citizens could go to one room and watch it, and um, reporters could go to a different room and watch it. And in the beginning, there would be 20, 30 reporters watching. And, and a couple of times I've gone, and it's just been me, you know, or two, two people. Not too many people are watching anymore. But one time, um, we were watching, and it's on this you know, video screen, and it all suddenly goes black. And it comes back up, and the judge says, "Well, it goes. It goes. It actually goes white, because if someone is saying something that they don't want us to hear, the judge can press the button, and and we don't see it, and we don't hear it. And in those days, if one of the defendants stood up, like, you know, not Khalid Muhammad, but some of the other guys that are with him, he doesn't usually do it, but they." Ramzi bin al Sheib would stand up and say, "I was tortured. I was tortured," and they shut him up because they weren't allowed to say the word torture. But you know, of course, after this, they're allowed to say the word torture. Now, when you go there, they they were allowed to say it. But this time, it goes white, and we look around. We say, "What is that?" And it comes back, and the judge said, "Who did that? I didn't do it." And then the trial stopped and went on and on. It turned out that somebody else had pressed the button, and it was the the thing called OGA, Other Government Agency, and um, that. <clears throat> I assume. That means the CIA. So they were somehow still in control of what was going on in this military court. And an, an, another time, the case ended because the attorneys found out that the room with the, um, the attorneys meet with their clients, which is supposed to have attorney-client privilege, which, as we know, we don't know, you know, who knows what's happened to attorney-client privilege in Trump land. but. Um, there was something, the, the thing at the ceiling that looked like it was the, the fire alarm system, it was actually a um, microphone. And other government agency was listening in to the attorneys and the defendants. So that stopped it for a while. So it goes on and on and on. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with this. But here's, here's someone else that uh, we have to remember that this is about. This is Daniel Pearl. And he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And this is March, January 2002, as, uh, just as Rajiv and, and just as uh, Masood and just as Peter 
and the other reporters who were uh, in Karachi and these other countries trying to cover the story. And he was there for the Wall Street Journal, and he got into a car with someone that he thought he trusted, and then he was uh, taken away. And in the end, he was, uh, he was killed. Um, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed first came to court in Guantanamo, and he didn't have an attorney, when they first brought them out of the black sites in 2006, they came into the courtroom, and um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed went up. He can read the transcript. He confessed to everything. He confessed to 9-11. To he confessed to things that no one had even suspected him of doing, including he said that he killed Daniel Pearl with his own hand. Um, so I keep that in mind when, I, when I'm in the courtroom and, and, and I, uh, I'm not in the courtroom. Actually, I'm behind a bulletproof glass. The courtroom, the courtroom is this big courtroom with like 50 people, because there's five defendants and every one of them has like 10 lawyers. I mean, it's, and the, and the, the um, prosecution is all military, huge. Um, um, but we are behind a bulletproof glass and we get a feed that's 40 seconds late. So we're watching it live, and it, it's a delay of 40, 40 seconds. And sitting with us is a curtain that can be drawn. The reporters are sitting in one place, and the curtain, beyond the curtain, there's always family members of the victims of 9-11 come down to the trial. And they... Um, they're really awesome people, and some of them are actually the firefighters from and the police, or the family members of people who were killed in 9/11. And um, we end up sometimes they don't want to talk to us, but in the end, we usually uh, you know do get to talk, and they're as um, appalled <laughs> as how long this is going on, how, how long this this case has been going on without to them any. Um, resolution to it. Uh, so, so 2004, we're still tracking these planes. And then the 9-11 uh, Commission report came out, which was also uh, pretty incredible that a lot of information came out, but also so much of it was held back. Um, so much of it was held back by the agencies, I believe, too. But what I did, I'm just my life, there's these footnotes. There are hundreds of pages of footnotes. And I said to myself, oh, I'm going to find out where are the black sites by looking through the footnotes and try to figure out uh, what I can. So I, it was the first week it came out. I went home for the weekend, and I, I still have it. I had this spreadsheet. Where I went into every footnote, and it said, detainee on this date was interrogated. And, and then it says, in another place, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was interrogated. And you could figure out that they mixed up, and they, they put the name of the guy when they shouldn't have. Or you could figure out two prisoners were in one place. I had this whole lengthy thing. I mean, it, they should have just given us the information. But instead, I'm like with this spreadsheet trying to figure out which prisoner was in which place on which on which day. And um, yeah, in a chronology. And that's at the same time, um, starting in 2002 and throughout that, that uh, the prisoners started to arrive in Guantanamo, January 11, 2002. And some of them were people who had been in this detention. And some of them, uh, many of them, were people who had been captured in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Some of them had been through this program, however. And we started to try to figure out who of the Guantanamo detainees who there was some kind of information on had gone through the program. They, uh, ACLU uh, had a lawsuit for the, uh, the, they started to get hearings. Each one of them got to come up and, and be asked ab about, you know, what they had done and whether they should, why, you know, to explain what they had done or who they were. And they, a lot of them were like very confused farmers from Afghanistan. But uh, going through the, that, uh, the ACLU sued and got the transcripts of 
all of the hearings of these detainees as they came into Guantanamo. And they also got a record of every time a detainee came into Guantanamo, they got weighed. They, that the date when they first came in, what their weight was, and then they would start a, a, a list of what they, when they were weighed and what they weighed, because they were going on a hunger strike. So, so this was information about the hunger strike, but it didn't have their names. So piecing together from the documents of the hearings and the, the documents of the weights and the date they came in, at the New York Times, my colleagues and I figured out for each detainee, what date did they arrive, and, and when did they leave? And this is the database that we had at the New York Times. And I'm still updating this because no one has left. No one has left since January 19, 2017. We used to have to keep up with it. And like we'd send messages, you know, uh, this guy got out. We had to like update it because it would, we wanted it to say the right number. You know? And this is an interactive. You can click on any of this, and you see a story for each person where they're from and, and who they are. Um, so this is when they got to Guantanamo, though. But this is like Bob Baer, who you probably have seen on, on CNN, because that seems to be, he, he was CIA, <laughs> now he's a CNN. Um, he, he says, uh, this is extraordinary rendition, not just rendition. It's the term is extraordinary rendition. You take the prisoner. He's in one country, and you bring him to another country where those interrogators will do their number on him. So as he says, you know, if you want them to be tortured, you send them to Syria, you know. This is Merar. He was sent to Syria. Uh, he's a Canadian Syrian guy. And he was at JFK Airport and one day, and uh, he arriving, and he was coming back from vacation, and they decided that he was someone of much suspicion. They put, put him in a plane. and took him to Syria. <coughs> and my friend uh, Stephen Gray figured out this from following the planes. But also, because Mayor got out, he's able to describe what the whole experience was. He was able to say what the plane looked like. And he also was able to get $10 million from the Canadian government for having uh, allowed him to be taken, uh, an innocent person taken and be tortured for several months. And um, Stephen Gray figured this out. That's what the plane looks like in the inside. This plane was not N379P. It was not 313P. I can't remember the number. The plane actually belonged to the Boston Red Sox. See, uh, it was being re chartered, rented by the Boston Red Sox um, owner. You know, when they don't use it, they charter planes out. You know, you have a plane. It's they're expensive. You charter the plane out. And so, um, it, sometimes it flew with the Boston Red Sox logo on it, and then other times it was taking people um, to, to, to torture or to prison, to imprisonment. Um, so just skipping ahead, when this came out, and this is like, so that was 2004, and then this is 2014. Ten years later, the report from the torture report comes out, and this is not showing up. Anyway. At the end, of, in the appendix of the torture, in the torture report, which you can come up and see, there is appendix two, December 2014. Here is the list of names of all of the people that were in this, in this rendition program, 119 people by name and where, how, where they were, when were they captured, and um, how long they were kept. But you can see the date they were kept is blocked out, and the date for how long that they were kept, only the first two numbers. So it says like 5, 4, blank. So you know it's like either 540, how many days? 541 days or 542. So it's, you know, it's, they, I don't know what the point of blanking out that last, that last letter was. But um, so there were. Dozens of people we never had heard of in all of those 13 years we've been following this case. There were, the, uh, you know, this the rendition. There was, uh, and in bold, which you could see if you, if I, if it was showing up, in bold is the people who had gone through the enhanced interrogation techniques. So. 
<clears throat> so this was the story that Dana did with Julie and me, where about the that plane, 379P, December 2004. Um, uh, the first uh, story that came out about that that plane owned by the uh, supposedly owned by the company in Massachusetts. But as Julie and I and Dana found, we looked up all those names of people who were on the corporate records, and the people didn't exist. So then at the New York Times, Stephen Gray and Scott Chain uh, followed up by looking more into those companies. That's when I moved to the New York Times. And I have to say, when I moved to the New York Times, the Washington Post pulled me into the, to the, the editor pulled me into his office and told me I couldn't take anything with me. So um, I did take this printout of my spreadsheet, <laughs> and I took my book. It still says the Washington Post on it. I took my copy. But um, I had to start all over again in this research, and I didn't want to do the same stuff. So instead, I was looking at the companies. And um, uh, so our story about the companies uh, appeared in May 2005. And uh, Scott, Scott went down to Smithfield, North Carolina, to the Johnston County Airport, where the planes were operated from, and talked to people who were pilots. Um, and uh, we figured out, from, from looking at the corporate records for that company and the corporate records for the other companies, that these fake people, that did, the people who didn't exist that were on the corporate boards, were sat on the boards of various companies that were doing the same thing. And uh, we were able to, oh, these guys in Sweden were doing the same thing that we were. And they had an awesome Swedish, uh, they were Swedish broadcasting. So they, they're the uh, 60 minutes of Sweden. And um, they were following the same trail. And uh, John Crudson from the Chicago Tribune, he was also doing stories on the same thing. And then this guy here is Croft in black. He is actually an uh, uh, academic and a, uh, advocacy, in an advocacy organization in London called Reprieve that defends uh, death penalty uh, and uh, detainees, and he has actually since, since most of the journalists have dropped doing this work, Crofton continues to do this kind of work and follows up on, on the planes. Because, because of what this all started, in Europe, people were uh, citizens and governments were very concerned that the planes had been stopping over in their countries at their airports, unbeknownst to these countries that uh, they were actually aiding in this rendition network. Uh, and and there's uh, uh, hearing. There's been hearings in uh, European courts, and and there's been lawsuits, and there's been there, there have been compensation to to some of the people from uh, European countries. It's a very much bigger deal in Europe than it is in here, as far as citizens are concerned. So Crofton continues to do this. He he has kept track of all of these different what he calls circuits of, of this is NP79. Hey, beyond what we found, he found more and more of the people who were taken from Poland to Morocco, people who were taken from Morocco to Afghanistan. They, it, they were shuffling people around and uh, bringing them to different prisons um, so, uh, so that they could keep on with the interrogations. And then later, we became more of the interrogations. They couldn't let these people go, because then they would tell that there had been interrogations. So it's, a, it, it's kind of a, a cycle. So uh, Crofton and his folks, uh, and some professors in England, are, are, are the rendition project, um, University of Sheffield and University of Kent. Uh, they have this extensive database with all of the documents and information that they've gotten doing their uh, research and lawsuits um, and uh, other activities in Europe. So for each person, they have a, they have a whole uh, biography where they were captured and where they lived. Where they ended up. So back to uh, US. 
as I, as I said before, we figured out that these planes had to land at airports. Uh, they had to land at military, military airports if they were going to be transferring people from military custody to CIA, whatever. So, so there, was a, there was a document from, I forget which, Civil Aviation uh, uh, Agency, which was the list of all of the aircraft that had permission to land at military bases military bases. And you could see when I looked at it, most of them were like, you know, American Airlines and FedEx and UPS and all of these uh, companies that had to land at military bases. And then there were like weird ones. So I, uh, so Premier was one of them. I said, okay. So what were the other weird ones? I started to look at all of the weird small airlines that were, uh, I looked them all up, but I mean, there were, there were several small ones. By the way, uh, I guess it's due to me. You, this document is no longer available online. Uh, it's, this is just when I, this is my own version of it. So um, I put a star next to a Devon Holding and Leasing, Aviation Specialties, Rapid Air Transport, Pat Corporation. These all ended up being uh, shell companies um, oh, and uh, this is from one of the European, uh, uh, the Council of Europe, which did an investigation and found that all of these airports in these countries had been used as landing places or transport or refueling uh, uh, spots for these, this network of uh, rendition planes. So. You can see this is names of people at Stevens Express. There's Erin Marie Cobb. And Erin Marie Cobb is also an executive of Devon Holding and Leasing in North Carolina. And uh, this is how we kind of mapped it out. And we had the people and the companies, and then they were all kind of, uh, I guess, early social network analysis. Uh, they all started to come together into a giant little hair, uh, hairball, and some of them I don't even some of them didn't even exist at all. So I, uh, but something did exist, and that was the company that actually operated the planes from its airport and did the repairs on the planes and uh, staffed the cleaning of the planes or what, whatever. So that company was called Aero Contractors, and it's. Um, in Smithfield, North Carolina. And they had to, you know, send letters to the uh, FAA and uh, that you can buy a CD-ROM for any, any plane that's registered in the U.S. for $10, and it gives you the whole history of the plane, including every time it was taken in for repairs, any time it had something new done to it, you can, you can get that record for that plane. And more recently, what well, we've been doing at The Intercept is we look for the planes that have been um, altered to have uh, surveillance equipment on it, uh, you know, in the in the U.S., the planes that you might see flying around Baltimore uh, uh, during uh, during uh, demonstrations, they're people, you know, plane spotters, which are citizen plane spotters, see planes flying around and around, and then. They either look them up our, uh, themselves, or they come to a reporter and they say, "This plane has been flying around. What can you tell? You know, is it surveilling us?" And you can get the uh, records of that plane, and then maybe see that they've had a uh, whatever they MC catcher, dirt box, or some of these equipments that can actually uh, uh, capture information from your cell phone from 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 a plane. But you can get that by looking at a CD. Oh, this is. Stephen did this. Um, then they decided to have the registration number changed after we, after several stories were written. They 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 want to change it. Uh, so it changed from N three seventy nine P to N eight zero six eight V, but it's a public record, so they, they were they really couldn't make that from us. And here's the airport. Um, so. A bunch of citizens in North Carolina are pretty angry and have uh, 
have spent some years trying to find out what's going on at that airport in their county and trying to do something about it. Um, they like tried to get laws passed. I mean, they, they are pretty active. But in December, they had a whole conference, the North Carolina Commission on Torture. It's a citizen group, and they had some, you know, a, a cooperation from uh, state agencies even, I think. But mostly it was uh, advocates and citizens. And they had a, I think, I think the uh, video of their whole commission that was held is, is available online. So this is 2017, it's still going on. Oh, back to Premier. Um, yeah. Oh no, they wanted to change the number again. Yeah, they changed the number a few times. Oh, here's another one. Erin Marie Cobb, she's also, she's the vice president of Stevens Express Leasing. So uh, this is one of my spreadsheets where I took all of the people and uh, sorted them by what companies they were in and what records. And then I did it the other way. There's the list of the people and then which company uh, are, are are they involved with? So you can see multiple. Aaron is four. Philip is in four. Philip does not exist. So um, untraceable individuals. Uh, so they are traceable. They would. They had a name and a post office box number and a social security number. In those days, we could look at social security numbers, but you know, you can look for the first five digits of a social security number. And there's also a coder that you can decode for the first digits of your social security number, like mine is 06040. That means I was from New York. I got my social security number in New York between this year and that year. I was very young because I was a child actor, so I, I you know, it's very, it's, a, it's very, a long time ago, but I was very young. and. So you could see that about a person. So um, we started to look up these people, and all they had was a post office box. And all they had was a social security number that was from 1990, although their age was supposedly 50, and they had gotten their social security number in 1990. Every one of them was that year. So we believe that what we'd figured out is these post office boxes that were in Virginia that the agencies were using for fake identifications. And I don't think they had any idea when they set these up that it was going to be so easy to figure out that we were all going to have computers and we were all going to be able to look things up. Um, supposedly, when this, this list of names and the, social, and, the, and the addresses were, because then what happened was we were able to look at the post office box. The post office box had 200 names in it. Who were those other people then? Were they code, you know, uh, names of their you know, their other IDs for, for people who were undercover. We didn't know, we didn't know what that was. When they, um, I believe the Washington Post took it to the CIA to look at it, and they were like, oh my god. You know, it's like, they said, it was bad trade craft. So, like her. Who's 57 years old and got your, and, and got your uh, social security number when you were 40? All of these people were at that post office box in Chevy Chase. Some of them I know from other documents. It's really bad. And here they are all again. Oh, and then the, the, this is the um, New York Times. They have this great graphics department. I mean, Stephen's graphic was confusing enough, but this was like the graphic an artist did. I still, I still can't figure out exactly what. <coughs> um, so we found, Stephen and I, in this period, we found 25 planes. But then Crofton, um, in his research since then in London, many, many more, many more planes, many more operations. And we're back to like, where are the sites? So when the report came out, this is 
This is what the report said. They named them by color, and we figured out where they were. But the thing that really turned up that was the shock to me when this report came out in 2014 was that there was two black sites in Guantanamo, and that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and, you know, they moved them there, that they were actually in Guantanamo for a while. And then um, when the Supreme Court decision Re Rasul uh, came out uh, saying that people had been held illegally, um, certain people, and they needed a habeas corpus, they moved them out. So they had secretly held the top uh, terrorists in Guantanamo under CIA um, uh, incarceration, not uh, Guantanamo's Department of Defense, but the CIA had their own secret little place. And it was like really funny because um, we had all these transcripts of the of the events of the uh, hearings for the Guantanamo detainees, and they like they keep they of course the interrogation is they're asking them about other people. So. So one, one guy says, um, why do you keep on asking me about Abu Zubaydah? He's here. Why don't you go still talk to him? Because even the prisoners knew that there, there were other prisoners being held se secretly through the, like, I thought that was crazy, but it turned out he was there. And oh, it's my photo. I took a photo. This is your classic Guantanamo photo. When you go there, they don't. Um, there's many things you can't take photos of. And also, they take your phone, and they look at your phone and t and every night and delete the photos that are. Uh, so, so Carol, who has been going there since 2002, she she's always finding these times when she, they let her take the picture of it two years ago, and now this year, suddenly the same thing is, 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 is classified. So she she's very ornery, and she publishes everything. Um, so this is the, see I had the black site at Guantanamo by Carol. Um, and this was, uh, this is Crofton's work from London showing that the planes did go to, to uh, a plane that, that picked the, up the guys, yeah, that's what it was. They collected uh, high value detainees, I think it was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and uh, Beta. I'm not sure who, who they were, but they collected them from the Poland prison, the Romanian prison, and Morocco, and they brought them to Guantanamo. And we even know what day it happened. We didn't know who was on the plane, but then it turns out that it was those, you know, really bad guys. And so Cora and I wrote this story because we thought there were 779 people had been held in Guantanamo. It turned out because another guy was secretly there, there's 780. And it was, it was Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, the guy who gave us the bad information about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. He later died in uh, prison in Libya. So, She's gonna, there's going to be a lot of questions for um, Ms. Haspel to answer during her confirmation hearings, I think. That's my, uh, that's my welcome mat. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. That's all I have. Uh, but I did want to show you one thing. And this Crofton, who I've been talking about from, from London, he and an artist uh, have put together this incredible book where the, the artist and photographer has gone to the sites of the, of the black sites where they were and taken photos of uh, the relics of what was there. You know, it's, a, it's one of them is in Poland. It's an airport in Poland. In Lithuania, it was an old horse stable that, that was renovated to be a prison. So the, the, there's like some really stunning, um, oh, also the documents. Here's like the, the uh, where the, the, the Red Sox plane. Well, uh, one thing that happened that with, with one of those planes, I think it was a Red Sox plane, one company that was a vendor sued the company that was the 
plane owner because they didn't get paid, and this was a lawsuit in Albany. All of his information about the black sites and the, and the chips came out because of the two companies suing each other in New York State Court. And uh, so these are some of the records that uh, came out of that. But you should take a look at this book. It was an exhibit. Um, it, uh, it was an exhibit, I think, in London and maybe in New York, the, the, the photos of, of the black sites. Uh, it's really quite interesting. So. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have uh, some questions and discussion. I wanted to start off and ask, have you or any of your colleagues at the Times or the Post ever visited one of these uh, secret prisons in Romania or wherever? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, they're not there anymore. Yeah. But um, just like this, this guy taking photos, people have gone to those places to uh -huh. try to Bonus. And I think the Romania one, the one in Romania, if you look, it's it's right in the middle of Bucharest. It's, uh -huh. it's like it's like uh, it looks like an office on the street. Amazing. And the the one that's in Poland though is in like some creepy woods, and the one that's in Lithuania is like horse stable. So it's it's pretty strange. What did the uh, Red Sox uh, organization uh, do when it was exposed that they their plane was being used? He wanted to change the tail number. Yeah. <laughs> Because he was getting harassed. It's the it's that it's not the it's the Red Sox owner. What is his name? I'm sorry. John. Uh, his private play. John Henry. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Discussion? Bill. <laughs> what, what are you doing with the, the Snowden files now? We publish them. Um, we. Uh, we read them and well, so what, what I'm doing with them right now is they're they're. The uh, NSA had an in-house newsletter called SID Today for Signals Intelligence Division. They had a, it's just like your regular newsletter, like the dorky one you have in, you know, like the Bell Labs or whatever, like, or, or, you know, the Washington Post newsletter. So it was for everybody who worked there, so it was readable, as opposed to a lot of the other documents which are really scientific and I don't know what they're talking about. But this was like, so it goes from, uh, who's going to win the prize for the best Christmas decorations to like, oh, and then we went to Guantanamo and tortured people, whatever, you know, so, so we're going through that entire public, that entire record of like 12 years of their internal newsletter and reading it and um, uh, making sure that we're, uh, w w uh, sorry to say, I redact the documents. We check to see if the person or information might be exposing someone to harm. And if we think it could, then we, we redact it. Yeah, but that's not Snowden documents, is it? Of what nature? Tell me. It's, uh, he just took everything out of whatever was in some file. I mean, I don't know what. Harming somebody? Hmm? In terms of harming somebody? Well, uh, a lot of people who work at the NSA don't tell anyone, even their own family, that they work okay. there. I know. I worked there for 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> but I did tell my family. <laughs> Were okay. you the curmudgeon? Pardon? There are some really interesting columns. Did you ever read this uh, the, in Sid Today? There were like some, there's like a column which is called Zelda. Uh, it's like a lovelorn, you know, a, a, a column for personal complaints. And then another one was called Gabby the, Gra the Grammar Geek. So it's all about grammar. And then there's another one that's called. Um, uh, the 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 uh, philosopher, the the signals intelligence philosopher, just like it's really interesting stuff. But those people's names, uh, there's no reason for their names to be public. Wait, we have a question right here. Okay, um, in your years of research, have you ever encountered much pressure? from the government that you're de delving into issues of national security? It, it doesn't usually affect me personally, because the reporters who deal with the government are the ones, you know, they talk to the government before they publish a lot of this stuff, and they, they're they the ones under pressure. After this was published, this is the only time, but after, after the plane stories were published, I did get a lot of mail from people saying I was a traitor. That, but those were from private people, not the government. 
So you're pretty much free to go do your research in this country? For me, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Bob? You showed us the, some of the little articles, I mean, where they said the plane stopped here or whatever, and uh, the person has taken off. Uh, but wasn't there, do I remember, there's one big one, uh, I think by Dana Priest, where, where we first learned that there is such a thing as rendition? Yes, okay. So that, the, I, I, I just wrote down this like little timeline about that. Because, so that plane story was in December 2004. But, but at, that, at that time, what we were doing, you know Steve Cole was our managing editor, and he had taken us into his office when we started working on this. He said, Wayne, we need to find out where they're keeping people in these prisons. We need to find the gulag. You know, that, that. So, um, so that's what she was doing beyond the planes. And she, uh, a story, she was, the story, the next story that she did, which, which was about the black sites, was in December 2005. Um, but uh, the government knew, had found out that she was working on that story around October 2005 because uh, either she was, you know, she was interviewing people near the end of the reporting and, and they knew what was going to happen. And that's, so uh, that's when the tapes all got destroyed. So following on the last question, and before before that big question, you would have had to go to the CIA or whoever and, and say, well, we're going to run this, and what's your response, and so forth. Uh, do you know then, was there any formal move by the government to say, no, 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 you can't publish this? Or, they didn't publish the names of the countries. Yeah, so first it just said there's a rendition program, but didn't tell where. Yeah, and she knew. And they had them at the time, but they figured that's... I mean, a bow to the government's plea that, that that's going to compromise security. Yeah, but then I also, that's when they destroyed those tapes with the proof about the torture, too. So I mean, I'm we, sure they also said, you can't say there's a rendition program, right? And the paper would have decided that, no, we're going to. Yeah, there is a negotiation that goes on. It's like, it's not like just what's going on on, on blocks, you know? I mean, there's a whole process of going to the sources and talking to them about it before you publish. And sometimes you decide not to publish things. And I don't know if that was right or wrong in this case. It took another, what, eight years to find out what countries they were in? You know, I think the history of it has been that the Post was regarded as courageous for going with the fact that there was a rendition program in the first place. Otherwise, we might never have known about it, I think. Right. Oh, I've got the mic, I guess. Um, really, really interesting story. Um, so a couple questions. I got here a few minutes late. You may have addressed this. Based on what you've been able to find out about the prisoners who are being held at Guantanamo, how many of them do you suspect were just rounded up erroneously and actually did nothing or very little? Well, I don't know exact numbers, but there's a lot. Um, how, would you put a chunk on that, like a third? The, the thing that makes it so so hard is that there was such they accused them of so many different things over the time and that's the documents that we actually have up on the on the Guantanamo docket website it's like they they talk they have transcripts like this year one year next year next year and they're still saying didn't you set off an IED and didn't you you know do this and the guy says no, I didn't, you know, and then they say, well, we can't release you because you did this, and you did this, and you did this. And then a few years ago, a lot of them, it just said, no longer, the way they put it is, there's no longer a reason to keep them. They don't say that they didn't do anything, but it's like, oh, they've like somehow rehabilitated themselves, or they, they're, they're, now they're better. But they, except for the people who are the, um, people of the Uyghur nationality yes. of China. Those are the only people they ever said, I believe, that were innocent completely. That Those are the were. three. No, they were, the, there were 14 of them. No, I knew there were 14, but you said only three were acquitted. Oh, no, the, acquitted is U.S. Okay. In the US. Yeah, that's what you missed. I was talking about people in the United, people who were uh, charged in the United States with terrorism. So how many people have been let go from Guantanamo? 
uh, 799 oh. minus 41. So there's still 41 there, as far as we know. <laughs> so I just want to get back to this question of this Kafka-esque situation where once you're interrogated, particularly if you're interrogated, if you're tortured, you're waterboarded, even if they know there's not, you did nothing, they can't let you go because then you will testify about torture. So how many people do you think are caught up in that crazy Kafka-esque cycle where they may not have done very much, but they can't be let go. I think they let some of them go. I, they must have them do the same thing of signing those agreements that they're not going to talk. The non-disclosure <laughs> agreements. But they're not going to sue. I mean, yeah, they have their non-disclosure agreements or something. But there's this one guy now. I feel, I feel, I feel bad for him. Mr. Darby. Mr. Darby uh, testified against several people um, during the Obama administration. He agreed to testify against, I don't know, it wasn't Khalidjik Mohammed, but it was some, some, some of the other guys that, you know, they were trying. And he had a plea agreement. He did, and then the date that he was supposed to, years went by. He testified in many trials, and he did whatever. They put him in a special place to live, you know, because he, he, he was, the only way to get out of there was like to plead guilty, right? So he pled, he testified. He was supposed to get out in February. It's, you know, it's April now. No one has left there since uh, January 19th, um, January 19th, 2017. So uh, what? this is an agreement, though. What's going to happen? He made his agreement. They, he lived up to his agreement, and the agreement was he was going to go back to Saudi Arabia. I and mean, it's not even the people who are in a bad way are the people from Yemen, because they, they won't send people back to Yemen. So most of the people who are left, who are the innocent ones, the ones who have been cleared, are from Yemen because it's the country's in such a bad situation that they don't they don't want to send them there but he's actually from Saudi Arabia so he could you know he could go you know they put that they have like a rehab program where they 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 uh, do watercolors and stuff in, in Saudi Arabia I'm real thank you um um would you say the public is um like the majority of public cares enough for issues of this kind? Um, I'm, 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 you could say I'm a positive person, but I'm kind of getting very uh, depressed and negative about whether the public cares about this. I mean, the, the idea of those, that those people from North Carolina that really are, are, are active and very interested in at least it not happening to their, in their community, you know. But in, in general, I mean, you know, th those are some bad guys, too. Like, what are you going to do with them? The guy did the worst crime we've ever had in this country. What are you going to do with him? It's, it, the families are infuriated because he lives on, you know, and, 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 and the years have gone by without any um, justice. Thank you. And I'd just like to say, I think you've done a magnificent bit of analysis on what is totally open source information. It's nothing classified about anything that you have access to at all. It's all open source information. And it's a magnificent bit of analysis. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. I, I, sometimes I feel like when, you know, like, uh, well, maybe the character from Homeland where she has all those little stickies on the wall, and then they take her away and they put her in the mental hospital. Right? But at, <laughs> at times, uh, my family has felt that way about me. Margo, over here. <laughs> I noticed that many of the companies that you put up on the screen there were, were formed back in the 1990s, early 1990s. So presumably, they were doing something before the rendition program. And then, obviously, when when their rendition program was exposed, the government presumably would start doing something different to hide what they were doing. What, what do you know about what these planes were used for before the rendition program, and what do you know about does the rendition program continue in some way that's now better hidden than it was before? I think we all screwed it up for them pretty much for, for this, you know. But the thing that's really interesting and it's in the story that Dana wrote. At, uh, no, this is in the story that Scott Chain wrote at the end in the New York Times story. We did our we did our research and we found out 
that the church committee in the 1970s, right, 1970s, there was one whole uh, hearing about Air America, which was the CIA's uh, planes uh, in yep. the 50s, you know, and in the after World War II when they started up their own uh, uh, airline. They had an airline. It was a big airline. They actually made money. I mean, it was a profitable thing. Yeah. Two, two. two airlines? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but at the <clears throat> uh, at the end, I can't, uh, who was his name? Lawrence Houston was testifying, and he was asked whether, um, whether they, they would do it again. You know, he said, oh, no, we can't do it again, because if, if we do it again, the next time if we did do it again, we have to do it in a way that we won't be found out. <laughs> and, yeah. I, the... I want to f follow up on that. Uh, what about the uh, pilots and the people who were taking care of the planes? Do you know, who, are, who were these, these people? Oh, were, gosh. Were they private contractors or what? Yeah. They're contractors, and it's a lot of, you know, ex-military or, like, ex... Uh, the people at Johnston County Airfield at the at that um, aero contractors, when, when Scott went down, he they actually, one of them took him up in a plane, and, you know, they, they kind of bonded. But um, they were CIA pilots for, you know, they left being CIA pilots and were contractor pilots. They, they're people who have been doing this for... Air, for Air America. And the thing that's funny was that um, uh, the pilots flew under fake names of pilot license. That, that's another thing that, that, was, that we discovered, that they had double, because uh, the pilot's licenses are, um, you know, they're public, and you can look up pilot's license. But when you look up, what Stephen figured out is he got the database, and he figured out how to sort it for the addresses and found out that they were the same person with two different pilot license names. And they had gotten the, their medical uh, examination, you can see on a pilot record the same day. Uh, I mean, the pilots were flying under fake pilot licenses, uh, too, which he... I think there's a question back there, too. Go ahead. Let, let her talk, and then you... So you talk a lot about, like, I've, um... You talk about what you found that the government doesn't want us to know, but what have you found, I guess, of that you've talked about that's actually illegal that the government's doing? Like, is the CIA allowed, or other government organization, are they allowed to make fake people with fake social security numbers? Are they allowed to have fake pilot, like pilots with fake license? Like, how? What's that line of they're allowed to do it, they just don't want us to know, or they're technically not allowed? They're allowed to. They're allowed to lie. I mean, that's. The CIA, they, the rules are different for for them, um, and obviously they thought they could do that list of thing of that you know that they could do that list. That's still the question: was that allowed or not? I mean, that's uh, no one has ever said that they're going to go to jail for doing that. I mean, this is this was they could get sued, and those contractors could get sued. But no one has been prosecuted. No one, and she's going to be the head of the CIA. People are going to, um, they're going to uh, put praise upon her at the, at the hearings. I was just going to tell a humorous story about the, the CIA airlines in Vietnam. So I was there with NBC. And they had two of them. What was Air America? And I can't remember the name of the other one. Uh, Evergreen? Yeah, uh, no, it wasn't Evergreen. Uh, but anyway, uh, and but they were CIA fronts, and they were happy to make money if they if the plane was down because sometimes we were allowed to hitchhike around on military aircraft, the reporters there. Uh, but if there wasn't a military aircraft available and you absolutely had to get to Thailand or someplace like that, you could charter it. This, this airline. <laughs> and then the pilots would say, well, last night we were over Cambodia and all these places where they weren't supposed to be. But I thought it was funny that the CIA was happy to make a little money on the, or the, at least the airline that was set up by them on the outside if, if the plane was not being used. And then make it from NBC, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, since all the analysis you did was on open source information, 
That is information that is available to anybody in the world if they know where to come for it. It is not classified. Nothing was classified. Nothing was. So everything that you did could have been done by any foreign nation that cared to figure this out. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. So I'm wondering, given the sort of posture around national security and foreign policy under the Trump administration, or Trump land as you described it, and with the sort of the rise of Gina Haspel, and also we have Pompeo doing some major kind of negotiating work in North Korea right now, where do you see the role of CIA kind of advancing on all these different fronts over these next few years? <laughs> I, I don't think about it, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the weeds. I'm going to find out when they've done something wrong. Do you anticipate um, stuff like this continuing? I don't do policy. <laughs> I don't, what do you think? How about, how about you, Bill? What do you, uh, what's your answer to that question? I have to repeat it. I was, my mind was somewhere. <laughs> I'm just wondering, given uh, who's in the White House right now, um, where is the CIA going from here with Gina Haspel kind of probably becoming director of the CIA and Mike Pompeo kind of moving over to the State Department. Is something like uh, extraordinary rendition continuing or growing or, you know, where, where, where is this all going from here is, I guess, my question. During the 1970s, during the church committee hearings and the pipe committee hearings. Let me give you I'm giving the mic because he knows something. <laughs> yeah, he was in the NSA for 30 years. During the uh, 1970s, during the Church Committee hearings and the Pike Committee hearings, they did exhaustive investigations of the uh, what the intelligence community had done. Every element in the intelligence community, one way or another, did a lot of things they should not have done. Um, and they were all taken seriously to task for this. It affected the CIA, it affected the National Security Agency, it affected a lot of other parts of the government, including the IRS at one point. Uh, I can speak relative to NSA. NSA took that very, very seriously, that what it had done was wrong, and it was not going to let it happen again. Uh, one of the things that, that I did during my career was I made sure that everybody in my organization that had to deal with foreign intelligence, that some of which could be collected within the United States by going through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, that they understood the Fourth Amendment, they understood all of the laws that were derived from the Fourth Amendment, and that they had to sign a piece of paper saying that they understood that. That program has been gracefully expanded now. In the case of NSA, I can't speak for CIA. In the case of NSA, they said, we are never going to let this happen again, and they put a massive program into effect to ensure that everybody understood these laws, including the contractors in NSA, such as Mr. Snowden, all right, who apparently didn't care about what he had been told about U.S. laws. And so he violated them. Um, CIA was guilty of doing a lot of things, too, a lot of which I know they did take to heart and can't do again. But you've got to understand, they are a foreign intelligence organization within the United States, and their main duty is to obtain information from foreign governments by whatever way they can. But they must obey US laws internally in the United States, and I think they've learned that. They didn't break any US laws in this, what she is talking about, and they tried to operate in as secretive a way they can, not understanding that a lot of their data is hanging out in the open for everybody, <laughs> like Margot, to take a look at. And that's what they have to clean up their act. I don't think the, you know, I do worry very much about this current administration, because I don't think they care that much about law. And that bothers me very, very much. But you uh, alluded, basically you alluded to something that is now coming out, which is there's no Secretary of State, there's no State Department effectively. So in the case of North Korea, the initiative, the overtures are being led by intelligence people not seasoned diplomats. So that is an, a new development. And what that actually means, going from here further, is uncertain. But it suggests to me that Trump and the White House 
are putting more uh, emphasis on the intelligence side of the government uh, administration in the execution of what we had traditionally known is American diplomacy. I, don't, I hope that's not true, but it looks like right now that's where. Who else has something? Okay, over there, yeah. Okay. Sorry to hog this, but we, we know now beyond any shadow of a doubt that torture does not provide good intelligence. So how is this whole history being cast as a way to protect the U.S. from terrorist acts? What I, what I hear is 9-11 didn't happen again. Say that again? I'm sorry. It didn't happen again. Oh, Nine that's their justification. It happened again. So, so it know, must have worked one. somehow. Yeah. All right, the homeland has not been attacked. Sure. Bill? I'll try to answer your question. I don't believe that... Facing towards I don't believe that, that, uh, ter that what the CIA did really provides you with reliable information. You must, any time you get information from somebody that you are torturing, you must verify that, me, that information by any means you possibly can. Just because you're beating somebody doesn't mean what you're getting is absolutely truth. After a while, the person who's being beaten is going to say, I'll tell you whatever you want. I'll make it up just to stop beating me. You know, I don't believe it is a reliable source of information. There was one of the uh, master interrogators uh, in the Israeli intelligence system who once said, you get nothing that you can rely upon by beating anybody. You've got to really befriend the individual in whatever way you can. And the information that you get after you've done that will be far more reliable than you're ever going to get by torturing somebody. I also, I, I recommend, um, if you haven't, to, to read this torture report. It's just. I, w I can't even read some of these things aloud that, that uh, the Senate committee uh, ha discovered was done to, to these people. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous. It's something that you would never think that um, Americans would do. And uh, I, I don't know, what the, you know how they can, uh, what they can do for these guys or, or you know, whether it matters with their guilt or innocence, but uh, it's just the idea that we had people, which some of which were people in our military who were ordered to do it, to, to ordered to do this kind of uh, uh, behavior towards other humans. It's like I don't, I don't know what I would do if someone ordered me to to do this Abu Ghraib type stuff. Let's give a great uh, warm applause to Margot. Thank you.